Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Uh, Mr. President, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Senator Mike Lee and Senator Chris Murphy uh, for their hard work on this important resolution, a work which, in fact, has gone on now for several years. Today is an extremely important day. Today, we in the Senate have the opportunity to take a major step forward in ending the horrific war in Yemen and alleviating the terrible, terrible suffering being experienced by the people in one of the poorest countries on Earth. And today, equally important, we can finally begin the process of reasserting Congress's responsibility over war making. As every school child should know, Article I of the Constitution clearly states that it is Congress, not the President, that has the power to declare war. In their great wisdom, the framers of our Constitution, the founders of this country, gave that enormously important responsibility to Congress because the members of the House and the Senate are closer and more accountable to the people of this country. Tragically, however, over many years, Congress has abdicated that responsibility to Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. Today, we begin the process of reclaiming our constitutional authority by ending U.S. involvement in a war that has not been authorized by Congress and is clearly unconstitutional. Last December, this body made history for the first time since the War Powers Resolution was passed in 1973. A majority of United States Senators, 56 of us in a bipartisan manner, used those powers from the War Powers Act to end U.S. involvement in a war. Today, we consider that exact same resolution once again in the new Congress. This time, however, unlike last session, this resolution will be brought to the House floor and I strongly believe will be passed. Let me say a brief word about the war in Yemen. In March of 2015, under the leadership of Mohammed bin Salman, then Saudi Defense Minister and now the Crown Prince, a Saudi-led coalition intervened in Yemen's ongoing civil war. As a result of that intervention, Yemen is now experiencing the worst humanitarian disaster on the planet. According to the United Nations, Yemen is at risk of the most severe famine in 100 years, with some 14 million people facing the possibility of starvation. In one of the poorest countries on Earth, as a result of this war, according to the Save the Children organization, some 85,000 children in Yemen have already starved to death over the last several years. An unimaginable number, unimaginable suffering and destruction. And if this war continues, what the experts tell us is that millions more will also face famine and starvation. Further, Yemen is currently experiencing the worst cholera outbreak in the world, as many as 10,000 new cases each week, according to the World Health Organization. This is a disease spread by infected water that causes severe diarrhea and dehydration and will only accelerate the death rate. The cholera outbreak has occurred because Saudi bombs have destroyed Yemen's water infrastructure 
and people are no longer able to access clean drinking water. The fact is that the United States, with little media attention, has been Saudi Arabia's partner in this horrific war. We have been providing the bombs that the Saudi-led coalition is using. We have been refueling their planes before they drop those bombs. And we have been assisting with intelligence. In too many cases, our weapons are being used to kill civilians. In August, it was an American-made bomb that obliterated a school bus full of young boys, killing dozens and wounding many more. A CNN report found evidence that American weapons have been used in a string of such deadly attacks on civilians since the war began. This past weekend, this past weekend, at least 20 women and a child were killed in a Saudi-led airstrike on Yemen's northwestern province of Hajar as they huddled in a house to avoid nearby clashes. As is so often the case in war, the innocent, the women and the children, pay the price. Late last year, I met with several brave Yemeni human rights activists. They had come to Congress to urge us to put a stop to this war. And they told me clearly, when Yemenis see made in America on the bombs that are killing them, it tells them that the United States is responsible for this war. That is the sad truth. Mr. President, the bottom line is that the United States should not be supporting a catastrophic war led by a despotic regime with a dangerous and irresponsible foreign policy. Some have suggested that Congress, that Congress moving to withdraw support from this war would undermine the United Nations efforts to reach a peace agreement. But the opposite is true. It is the promise of unconditional U.S. support for the Saudis that undermines those efforts. And we have evidence for this. Late Dece last December, as we were preparing to vote on this same resolution, we received news that U.N. Special Envoy Martin Griffiths reached a breakthrough agreement for a ceasefire in the port city of Hodeidah. And that ceasefire, which is being maintained today, is enabling food and increased humanitarian aid into the country. I have spoken to people at the highest level of those negotiations who have made it clear that our actions here in the Senate played a significant role in pushing Saudi Arabia toward an agreement. That pressure must continue, and the resolution that I hope we pass today will do just that. So our effort on this issue has clearly made a positive impact. And I thank all of the co-sponsors of this resolution for their efforts and all of the civil society organizations, progressive and conservative organizations, who have worked so hard to raise awareness of this conflict and the constitutional implications. Mr. President, above and beyond the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, this war has been harmful to our national security and the security of the region. The administration defends our engagement in Yemen by overstating Iranian support for the Houthi rebels. Let me be clear. Iran's support for the Houthis is of serious concern for all of us. But the truth is that support there is far less significant than the administration claims. And the fact is that the relationship between Iran and the Houthis has only been strengthened by this war. The war is creating the very problem the administration claims to want to solve. 
This war is also undermining the broader effort against violent extremists. A 2016 State Department report found that the conflict had helped al-Qaeda and the Islamic State's Yemen branch, quote, deepen their inroads across much of the country, end of quote. As the head of the International Rescue Committee, former British Foreign Minister David Miliband said in a recent interview, quote, the winners are the extremist groups like al-Qaeda and ISIS, end of quote. Late last year, the Wall Street Journal reported, and I quote, nearly two years after being driven from its stronghold in Yemen, one of al-Qaeda's most dangerous franchises has entrenched itself in the country's hinterlands as a devastating war creates the conditions for its comeback, end of quote. And here is something that should deeply concern us all. At a time when we are spending billions to fight terrorism all over the world, a February CNN report revealed that Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners have transferred American-made weapons to al-Qaeda-linked fighters in Yemen. Does anyone here think it makes sense that U.S. weapons should be given to groups who have declared war against the United States. So this war is both a humanitarian and a strategic disaster. And let us also not forget that this war is being led by a despotic, undemocratic regime in Saudi Arabia. The United States of America, the most powerful country on Earth, should not be led into a regional war by our client states who are trying to serve their own narrow and selfish interest. It should not be Saudi Arabia that is developing and implementing American foreign and military policy. Saudi Arabia is a monarchy controlled by one of the wealthiest families in the world the Saud family. In a 2017 report by the Cato Institute, Saudi Arabia was ranked 149th out of 159 countries for freedom and human rights. Is this really the kind of country whose foreign policy we should be supporting with U.S. taxpayer dollars? For decades, the Saudis have funded schools mosques and preachers who promote an extreme form of Islam known as Wahhabism. In Saudi Arabia today, women are treated as third-class citizens. Women still need the permission of a male guardian to go to school or get a job. They have to follow a strict dress code and can be stoned to death for adultery or flogged for spending time in the company of a man who was not their relative. Last year, Saudi, Saudi activist Lujain al hathlal a leader in the fight for women's rights, was kidnapped from Abu Dhabi and forced to return to the country. She is currently imprisoned along with many other human rights activists. Human Rights Watch reported that imprisoned women activists have been subjected to torture, including electric shocks and other forms of physical and sexual assault. The people of the entire world received a very clear understanding about the nature of the Saudi regime with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Turkey. All of the evidence suggests that the Saudi crown prince was directly responsible for that murder. Is that really the kind of regime whose leads we in the United States should be following? Mr. President, I believe that the U.S. Congress has become far too comfortable with military interventions all over the world. We have now been in Afghanistan for nearly 18 years, the longest war 
in American history. We also have troops in many other countries around the world. The time is long overdue for Congress to reassert its constitutional role in determining when and where our country goes to war. This resolution provides that opportunity, and I hope this body will do exactly as it did in December and in a bipartisan manner pass this resolution. The humanitarian catastrophe has only gotten worse in Yemen, and our intervention there is every bit as unconstitutional as it was when we passed this resolution in December. Let us bring this catastrophic war in Yemen to an end. Let us focus our efforts on the diplomatic, on a diplomatic resolution to end that war, and let us provide the humanitarian aid needed to protect the hungry and the sick in Yemen. And let us today, in an historic vote, 45 years after the passage of the War Powers Act, let us today reassert Congress's constitutional responsibility in terms of war making. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Connecticut. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I am very pleased once again to join uh, my friend, the Senator from Vermont, uh, on the floor uh, to press uh, this body to take seriously its constitutional responsibility and its responsibility uh, to assure that uh, the United States doesn't enter into hostilities abroad other than those situations that are vitally necessary to protect our national security interests. And uh, I am so proud to have worked with Senator Sanders and Senator Lee and many others here to build a truly bipartisan coalition that is going to do something that, as Senator Sanders said, is historic. Uh, I have been coming down to the Senate floor for four years now, uh, raising concerns. Uh, about the U.S. participation in this uh, civil war. Very few people could probably locate Yemen on the map when the United States first entered in uh, to an agreement with the Saudis to help them in their bombing campaign. Uh, today, it is the subject of national conversation. Uh, and with the passage in the Senate and in the House, regardless of what the President chooses to do, the world now knows that the United States is paying attention to the world's worst humanitarian disaster, a nightmare inside Yemen that is taking the lives of tens of thousands of people. Sometimes humanitarian disasters, sometimes famines are caused by natural events, those that we cannot control, droughts, for instance. This is a man-made humanitarian catastrophe, a man-made humanitarian catastrophe that the United States has something to say about, and we are going to say something about it in a matter of hours. Let me um, just say a few things about what will happen if we pass this resolution and it becomes law and what will not happen if we pass this resolution and it becomes law. I think Senator Sanders covered this and we have covered this enough. The first thing that happens is that we uphold the Constitution. I get it. Declaring war is a lot tougher today than it was 40 years ago or 100 years ago. It's not as if there are big armies that march at each other across open fields. Very rarely is there a nice, neat peace treaty signed to wrap up hostilities. Now we have shadowy, more diffuse enemies that are harder to define. We have wars that seem to never end. But that doesn't obviate Congress's responsibility to set parameters around war. Just because it's harder to declare war today doesn't mean that we don't still have the responsibility to do it. Over and over again, we have outsourced the decision about hostilities to the president, whether it be President Obama or President Trump, in large part because we just don't want to be in this business any longer. There is no doubt when we are helping Saudi Arabia drop bombs on churches, on weddings, on cholera treatment facilities, and on some legitimate military targets that we are engaged in war, and we should declare it here. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens if we pass this resolution and it becomes law is that we wash our hands of the blood associated with being a participant in the creation of one of the world's worst humanitarian catastrophes. Never has the world seen a cholera epidemic as big as this one, at least in recorded history. And there's no secret as to why there is a cholera epidemic, because the Saudis bombed 
the water treatment facilities so that the water isn't clean any longer. Now, whether or not the United States knew about this or signed off on it, we don't know, but the fact of the matter is we should not be associated with a bombing campaign that the UN tells us is likely a gross violation of human rights. Third, if we pass this resolution, it becomes law, peace becomes more likely, more likely. We have evidence of why that is, because when we passed this resolution in the Senate at the end of last year, not coincidentally, within days, a ceasefire, a partial ceasefire, was announced in Hudeda. Why is that? Why is that? The reason is twofold. One, when the Saudis realize they don't have a blank check from the United States any longer, they get more serious about peace. But two, the Houthis, who are the other parties of this conflict, who don't believe that the United States is an honest broker or that anyone will actually be serious about enforcing concessions that they give, come to the table because they see that the United States and others that we support as part of the negotiations will actually be honest brokers, that we are only willing to go so far with our Saudi partners. The fourth thing that happens is, as Senator Sanders has mentioned, we are able to send a message to Saudi Arabia and specifically to the Crown Prince that they need to change their behavior if they want to maintain this relationship. Some people are going to vote against this because they say it has nothing to do with Jamal Khashoggi. It does. Jamal Khashoggi's name isn't in here. The name isn't in here of the other American residents that are currently being detained by Saudi Arabia. But make no mistake, Mohammed bin Salman, who has ordered this campaign of political repression, his number one foreign policy priority is the perpetuation of the war inside Yemen. And given the violation of trust that has occurred with the United States over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and the cover-up of it, it stands to reason that we would rethink our association with other priorities of the Crown Prince if he lied to us blatantly about his participation in the human rights violation that has become the obsession of this country and the world. The two are connected. They, this will be seen as a message to the Saudis that they need to clean up their act. What will not happen? Casualties will not get worse. The Trump administration says, well, if we're not part of the coalition, it just means that we can't stop civilians from being killed. Well, forgive me, but it doesn't seem like we've been doing too good of a job thus far if 85,000 children under the age of five have died of starvation and disease, and tens of thousands of civilians have been caught in the crossfire. We can't get into classified information here, but let's just say that there is a limit to what the United States can do uh, as part of this coalition. Uh, and there is no evidence to suggest that casualties will get worse. Uh, in fact, the cover being lifted of U.S. endorsement of this bombing campaign will make it harder for the Saudis to take chances because they know that they don't have the U.S. to fall back on. Second, the Saudis won't go somewhere else. This idea that if we just say we're not going to participate in this one single war with you, that the Saudis will all of a sudden break relationships with the United States and go buy their military equipment from Russia, um, it, it just is, is belied by how this alliance has worked for years and the complication of the Saudis turning around and choosing to go to another partner. And if that's how this works, that the nature of our relationship is one in which the United States can never, ever refuse a request from the Saudis to participate in one of their military endeavors overseas, then that's not an alliance. <laughs> an alliance allows you to tell your partner when you think that they're wrong and choose, unless you have a treaty obligation of some sort, uh, as to whether you engage with them. And lastly, as I mentioned, some people say we will lose our political leverage, that we will make it harder for negotiations to happen. Exactly the opposite, as evidenced by the fact that when we were debating this resolution last time, as people were telling us that if we passed it, we wouldn't have as much leverage in the negotiations, successful negotiations were being con concluded uh, in Stockholm. Um, this is a historic moment for the Congress to step up and say that enough is enough. We are made weaker in the eyes of the world when we willingly participate in war crimes, when we allow 
for our partner to engage in activity that leads to the slaughter of innocent. Never mind uh, the conduct of a war in which our true enemies, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, are getting stronger and stronger by the day. I hope that we have the same bipartisan stamp of approval uh, on this resolution uh, today as we did last year. And I hope that it stands as a new day for this Senate when we are more willing uh, on a bipartisan basis to do our concurrent responsibility along with the executive branch to set the foreign policy of this nation. I yield back. Mr. President. Senator from New Jersey. Mr. President, first I ask unanimous consent that Brandon Jacobson, a fellow from the United States Office of Personnel Management, be granted floor privileges while he serves on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations to August 15th of 2019. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise uh, today to again support efforts to stop U.S. direct military support for the Saudi-led coalition efforts in Yemen. I don't need to remind my colleagues what's at stake here. Each time we have considered this resolution, the situation for Yemenis is even more dire. Now in its fourth year, this conflict has put nearly 16 million people on the brink of starvation, including 400,000 children who are severely malnourished, displaced more than 3 million people, and done nothing to increase stability or prosperity for the people of Yemen. In fact, the longer this conflict goes on, the larger Iran's foothold in Yemen grows and the more entrenched opposing political factions become. In addition to the horrifying humanitarian crisis, we've also learned that U.S. coalition partners may be transferring U.S. origin weapons to known, underline known, terrorist organizations. And we've uh, read alarming reports about torture and abuse in prisons throughout Yemen, both Houthi and coalition control. So I'll simply repeat what I've said before. It is in the interests of the United States to put as much political pressure on the parties to end this conflict as we can. Yes, we have strategic partnerships with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, but we must find a way forward to get those relationships on a path that truly serves U.S. interests. To be clear, the Houthis bear significant responsibility in the deterioration of the state of affairs in Yemen, and that's without a doubt. But we do not have diplomatic relations with the Houthis, and we certainly don't sell them arms or provide active military support. So, Mr. President, this resolution is a good first step. But what we really need is a comprehensive approach to address our interests in the Gulf, along with Senators Young and Reed, Graham, Shaheen, Collins, and Murphy, I introduced the Comprehensive Saudi Arabia Accountability and Yemen Act. The bill calls for a suspension of offensive weapons sales to Saudi Arabia, sanctions all persons responsible for blocking humanitarian access in Yemen or supporting, supporting the Houthis in Yemen, and urges accountability for all actors in Yemen guilty of war crimes. Finally, it also addresses some of the most reckless Saudi actions by calling for true accountability for those responsible for the murder of American resident and journalist Jamal Khashoggi and a report on human rights in Saudi Arabia. So, Mr. President, I support this resolution, encourage us to continue the debate. We must evaluate our relationship with these partners and find a path forward, not just in Yemen, but indeed in the entire Gulf region that truly promotes American interests and American values. But today is a day that we can make a clear and unequivocal uh, statement uh, that we do not support this continuing uh, conflict and humanitarian disaster. There, there is a consequence for acting in the way that the coalition has done, in many cases uh, clearly irresponsibly with the reckless loss of human life. Uh, and then I hope we can continue to work on uh, to go beyond that so that we can deal with the entire uh, region's challenges. I look forward to whatever is the agreement on uh, amendments that may be considered here. I personally would like to see this get an up or down vote as a resolution. I understand there may be some amendments. Uh, depending upon what amendments are made uh, in order, I may seek a second degree amendment uh, at the end of the day. 
uh, I am concerned that one of these amendments that are contemplated uh, may be well-intentioned, but also may very well be used in such a way to actually undermine the very essence uh, of uh, the underlying vote that we are taking. So I'll reserve my judgment until that time on that. But in the interim, I urge all of my colleagues uh, to continue to support, as they did in the last vote on this question of this resolution. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor and observe the absence of a quorum. C-SPAN, where history unfolds daily. In 1979, C-SPAN was created as a public service by